Good evening, questionnaires and quarantiers. Welcome back to La Trobe's Sport and Exercise uh, Research Centre Q&A session. Um, we're really excited to have you join us uh, th this evening or this morning, depending on where you are. Um, we're really excited to talk to you today and have our guests discuss ACL injuries and its impact on knee osteoarthritis. Now, if this is your, you've been here before and gone through the webinars, uh, welcome back. For those who it's your first time, never fear, because actually we have our own YouTube channel. So you can go back and watch our previous, uh, our previous sessions, if this was gonna work. Here we go. Anyway, you can go back to our YouTube channel and search Latrobe SEM. And in that, you'll be able to see all our previous... Um, that's not going to work, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, you can go to YouTube, search Latrobe SEM, and our channel is there where you can see all of our previous... Um, webinars and Q and A's. You can also go to our blog where not only can you watch the previous Q and A webinars uh, or listen to it on SoundCloud, you can also see the links to the references from studies that we were mentioned uh, during the Q and A. And lastly, if you're not already, it's always a good idea for you to follow our Twitter account as well as our Facebook. And Matt Wordnam has been nice enough to include the links for our YouTube and our SoundCloud in the chat. So well worth bookmarking that. So without further ado, um, we've, we're very lucky to have um, Dr. Adam Colvener an NHMRC Early Career Research Fellow. Uh, he's a physiotherapist by trade and has his research interest mainly revolves around uh, ACL injuries and its impact on knee osteoarthritis. So, Adam, welcome and thanks for coming tonight. Thanks, Sean. It's good to be here. Looking forward to the discussions. Fantastic. So, First of all, I just want to go through a bit of housekeeping in case this is your first time uh, to our Latrobe Q&A. Uh, firstly, what the timing is that Adam and myself are going to go through a brief sort of intro about what we're going to cover. And then we're going to allow you about 40 minutes to ask your questions. Now, how you ask your questions is through the Q&A function. So you should see that at the bottom of your uh, Zoom window. And in there, you can place your question. The great thing with the Q&A function as well is it allows you to upvote certain questions. So if someone has asked a question that you really want to know the answer to, it's a good idea for you to upvote because it becomes more apparent and more likely that I'll ask it. Um, also, I might come to you uh, to directly ask your question and I'll ask you to unmute your microphone. So be prepared uh, to unmute and ask your question directly to Adam or our other guests. Um, is, can everyone else hear me fine? I've sort of noticed Marco um, has, an, has an issue with sound. I hope I'm all good, Adam. I can hear you. Yep. Brilliant. All right. So let's get stuck into it, seeing as we uh, sort of, Marco, I'm not sure what's going on, but we'll get into it. Um, Adam, you're a country boy from way back. And I heard a rumor that you had some interesting sort of fashion choices when you started university, especially around wintertime. I don't know where you got that uh, story from, Sean. Um, yeah, so I'm from uh, central Victoria, up in a little place called Newstead, and it's um, even some pretty frosty winter mornings there. We all like to get around in shorts and thongs and T-shirts. So I um, braced the Melbourne winter coming down and staying on campus at La Trobe um, in one of the colleges here for my undergrad doing physio. And, um, yeah, turned a few heads with my footy short attire. I thought it was great for physio. You know, you get your, your massage and your, your knee pracks, and so you're... Your lower limbs, they're ready to go. But um, apparently I wasn't that, you know, city slicker, um, tight jean wearing uh, <laughs> physio that uh, some of my colleagues were. Did the footy shorts get uh, tra travel with you to Austria? 
Uh, yeah, so I spent a little bit of time in Austria doing some research the last few years. Um, they did. I, yeah, not really a fashion um, accessory of choice over there, I must say. <laughs> short, uh, you might have soccer players use a bit longer shorts than us yeah. AFL players. So uh, you might have started a trend. Maybe next time you go back, you'll see everyone with footy shorts. Um, and the other thing that sort of you and I have had a discussions about is that you sort of like tasks which are very much have a step and a process, and you sort of can follow it. Now, you've been one of the students that have attended the Michael Girdwood uh, Culinary School and learned how to bake bread. That's a good example of following the process. Do you have any other hidden talents where that skill's been uh, useful? I'd like to preface that by saying that I learned sourdough baking with Michael Girdwood before the coronavirus hit. So I was, you know, not a, uh, I was an early adopter, shall we say, uh, not a follower. Um, thanks, Mick. Um, a couple of my other hobbies that lend itself to being a bit more anal, I suppose, is um, I used to be an avid stamp collector, which I'm sure uh, many of uh, us uh, at LASM probably won't know either. Um, I think they're at uh, mum and dad's place under the house somewhere. I tell them that it's worth you know lots of money eventually with all these you know rare stamps I'm going to live off um, in the future, but um, I'm not sure about that. And also, I did run a marathon uh, a few years ago as well, so I very much enjoyed the, the rigour of following a program and and uh, you know, checking all of my heart rate and uh, loading data as well was quite, uh, yeah, spoken to my uh, analness as well. <clears throat> uh, fantastic. So I suppose that's also one of uh, the reasons why you're such a fantastic researcher. And I just wanted to start with covering off about what your research interests and what your sort of PhD and your postdoctoral research has really led you to. So ACL is always a fascinating topic. It's uh, a lot of papers are out there and a lot of the focus is around either uh, return to play or the mechanisms of injury. But I suppose your research is a bit of a, uh, a different tact in terms of you've really looked at uh, what is the impact of ACL injury on basically the long-term health of that knee? Um, so I was wondering if you could share with us some of your work around sort of the prevalence and the sort of burden associated with uh, osteoarthritis following an ACL injury. Yeah, sure. So I started out in this area about 10 years ago now, actually, and um, I sort of started working with Kay Crosley, who many of you will know as, as the director of our research centre. And we were referred a patient, a young guy at about 35 years old um, from an orthopedic surgeon who was fit and well um, prior to an ACL injury sort of 10 years prior. And now at the age of, I think he was 30 or 35, he um, had severe pain and couldn't walk and debilitating um, function. He couldn't play with his kids. He wanted a knee replacement, um, but his surgeon said he was too young. When we looked at his x-ray, Quite surprising to us, um, a lot of the, the joint changes, and they were very severe, were actually in the patellofemoral joint. And so that really set our um, interests and went into the literature to look at, you know, is this common, um, having this sort of amount of, um, you know, burden, OA, pain, symptoms, functional incapacity um, in young people. And, and we were, um, you know, searched a lot of literature and found that, you know, it's not uncommon. So about 10 years following an ACL injury, irrespective of whether you have surgery or not. And we can, we can go into details about the surgery versus non-surgery approaches later on, I'm sure. But about 50% of people 10 years after an ACL injury or reconstruction will have radiographic osteoarthritis is what the evidence tells us. Now we know that not always um, imaging correlates directly with symptoms, but there's also a lot of data out there to suggest that um, about the same amount of people actually have ongoing impairments and symptom, symptomatic OA as well. And so unfortunately, once sort of the, the X-ray changes or OA disease gets to sort of an end stage and can be seen on, on radiographs, there's really not a lot we can do as clinicians. There's no drug or no exercise therapy that's been proven to be able to um, you know, reverse those changes. We can only, re only really manage the symptoms and the function. And we know that exercise is a great um, treatment for those types of things. But I suppose what led us to, um, that led us to in some of my early research is looking at the early joint changes within the first year after ACL injury and reconstruction and trying to work out what um, profile these people have that might put them at risk of longer term changes. So we used MRI um, outcomes, a lot of different patient reported outcomes very early on following the injury 
and found actually that there was quite a lot of arthritis, early arthritis changes on these MRIs we took as well, which was quite surprising for us. Um, and we've done some work um, looking at the sort of the long-term outcomes of those um, knees as well. Do they progress and what, what sort of profile of people do they progress in? So we can start to think about what we can do as clinicians early on following an ACL injury and reconstruction during the rehab process that we can try and change the possible trajectory of early arthritis in this group as well. And I think in, the, in our whole conversation tonight, I think it's really important that not everyone will have a poor outcome after ACL injury and reconstruction. Um, some people do really well, and I think that's really important to remember. Uh, but there are a lot of people who, um, for whatever reason, uh, and, and the literature is growing in this space, that, that don't do well. And I think we have a, a big um, role to play in trying to maximise maximize those outcomes for these patients. That's brilliant. And sort of one of the things that sort of strikes me in the number of times if you've, if you've talked about radiographic changes or changes on imaging. So I don't know, I wanted to, and Matt's actually put a link to your systematic review about the prevalence of uh, cha uh, imaging changes in the cartilage uh, in asymptomatic people. So I think that's a really important point. I wonder if you could speak to that about, well, even though you, there is a strong prevalence of OA changes post ACL, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up with um, symptoms or a poor function. Could you speak to that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think um, as clinicians dealing with you know, any type of patient where we have imaging, it's really important to put, that, put those imaging findings into context of what it means to the patient in front of us. And so... As I said, we've, we've done some MRI work in the, the post-ACL group, finding that about a third of people at one year after ACL reconstruction already have what we call MRI-defined osteoarthritis. But in the systematic review um, you've shared and referred to, this is really important to note in this context as well, is that when you look at people who are totally asymptomatic, no injury history, so a healthy knee, the prevalence of, say, a cartilage defect in these knees, if you're more than 40 years of age, is about 43%, I think we found. So not an insubstantial number. In those younger people, less than 40, it was a bit less, but still I think about 20, 20% or so, 15, 20%. So just because someone in front of you has a scan that says you've got a cartilage defect or a bone marrow lesion, don't always assume that that's gonna be the source of their pain. I think that's why it was really important that when we found these early changes in a post-traumatic group that we've followed them up sort of longer term to work out are these features benign and do they disappear or do they are they associated with symptoms or actually are they an early indicator of sort of future problems down the track and, and something as we can try and target um, in our treatments to try and either reverse some of these early changes such as a bone marrow lesion, there's treatments able to you know, reduce the size of those um, or in, in terms of you know, some of the early cartilage changes as well, there's emerging evidence that some of these early changes might be reversible, which is really promising for us um, as clinicians. And, and it's really about the exercise-based um, work, strengthening, loading of the joint. Joints like, like to be loaded. Um, and there's, we've just done some, some recent research in, um, in our group with some of the um, mechanical engineers, Praz, Sritharan, who's been uh, helping us out, looking at some modeling data and contact forces across the joint looking at actually the ACL reconstructed knee actually tends to underload compared to the other joints. So it's not typically what we normally see in an OA joint that might be, you know, you overload, you wear and tear. Following an ACL injury, it, it seems to be like there's some other mechanisms uh, involved as well, which we can, you know, chat about later, but it's uh, a very broad, broad area with lots of different risk factors involved. Fantastic. I think one of the things that I'd like to pick on, and it's probably a good opportunity for us to bring in our second guest, is that uh, about identification or sort of the factors that are associated with uh, worse outcomes. So we're lucky enough to also have tonight uh, Brooke Patterson, who is close to completing her PhD. It's sort of, I, I, I think her supervisors are actually reading her thesis at the moment. Um, she's Obviously, her research interest is around ACL and knee osteoarthritis. Um, she's a physiotherapist, but also has the unique experience of uh, being a professional uh, Australian rules football player, as well as having experience in ACL injury. So, 
Brooke, I'll get you to unmute your microphone and turn on your video. Um, welcome tonight. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me. I can't turn on my video um, for some reason. It says the host has stopped it. Ah. There we go. <laughs> Hi, good to see you. <laughs> um, just to point out an, an X hat X player. <laughs> oh, you're still in our heart. I'm tired now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things that Adam brought up about is sort of identification of factors and actually who's going to progress for having worse outcomes. I know a lot of your uh, PhDs have looked at um, outcomes five years after an ACL reconstruction. I was wondering if you could sort of share with us, what are some of the factors that might help us identify those that are going to have poor outcomes? Yeah, great question. And yeah, I was lucky enough to meet Adam a few years back and complete a follow up on the study that he started. So um, to give the audience a little bit of background, we basically have MRIs on people after their reconstruction at one and five years. And then um, part of my PhD was to look at the changes on those MRI scans. So yes, there might have been lots of um, cart cartilage lesions, bone marrow lesions at one year, but what actually happened to those um, lesions over the next four years um, and that really enabled us to then look at I guess what factors were associated with people that had an accelerated worsening of their cartilage, their bone marrow, their osteophytes, their meniscal lesions and because what we knew from the literature was that only the only factor with really strong evidence to predict those that kind of had that accelerated early arthritis was a like a concomitant um, meniscal lesion so it, the time of surgery, the, the surgeons noted, yeah, this person has got like a meniscal lesion or a cartilage lesion. Um, so there wasn't really any strong evidence to support any other factors. And of course, we can't do anything about those meniscal injuries once the ACL injuries happen. So we we're really interested in trying to delve and find out more. Um, and what we did find in um, those first couple of studies is that um, BMI at one year after reconstruction was strongly associated with worsening in mainly the tibiofemoral joint and also some of those patellofemoral joint features. And then we then went on to have a look at functional performance. So looking at um, three different hop tests, uh, one leg rise test, and looking at the performance of one year and whether that predicted those that had more worsening. And in fact, those that had less than 90% limb symmetry on that battery of tests, they had an increased risk of uh, worsening of patellofemoral OA features. So um, they're the two factors that we've really, I guess, identified in this post-traumatic OA population. And some of Adam's work has also looked at um, quadricep strength as well. We know it's really important in primary knee OA. So we think it might be important in, in this post-traumatic OA after ACL reconstruction, but we haven't, we haven't got the studies there yet. I think that paper around the functional test is so useful for clinicians because they're relatively simple tests that you can do, aren't they? Yeah, and that's, I think, why Adam did do some testing with the isokinetic dynamometers at one year, but we decided at five years just to, one, to reduce participant burden, but two, these tests are something you can do with limited space and equipment training. They're not expensive, so, and we know that they are correlated to some of those, like, more fancy isokinetic muscle testing, so... We chose to use those and it's, um, yeah, been nice, to, I guess, to show that um, that they are related and we know that they actually are modifiable and we know as like clinicians we can actually address those um, functional performance deficits. Brilliant. And Matt the Wizard has actually posted the link in the chat, so it's there for yes. you, for everyone to see that paper. Now, we're going to open it up to you, the attendees. Now, we're going to start with Tim Barnwell. Tim, did you want to talk about whether age affects the progression of OA? Yeah, I was just really um, intrigued about whether there is a difference in the cohort um, of people being impacted by OA. Um, there's a lot of debate in the areas that I work um, with regards to the paediatric cohort and needing to look, look after them. So I'm just really intrigued as to whether we need to be a bit more careful with that group than maybe other groups. Adam, we might start with you answering that one. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think the paediatric group is a, definitely a different group of patients in the ACL space. There's often different surgical techniques used to, you know, restore um, or protect the, the um, bone 
plates and things like that. Um, and whether, you know, having a talking about non-operative management or operative management, we can chat about that later for this group as well. But um, there's not a lot of longer term studies looking at, though, I don't think looking at the young population who have had an ACL injury, say, before they were 18. Um, I know that young people who have an ACL reconstruction are at high risk of re-injury, uh, for sure. Um, and that obviously increases the risk of, you know, re-surgery and, and poor outcomes as well. In general, I think um, across the general population, obviously um, the risk of osteoarthritis generally increases as you age. And I think we see that no differently in an ACL population as well. The older population tend to develop more OA than younger folk. Um, but does that sort of answer your question, Tim, or is it a specific? Yeah, I suppose I'm thinking, I'm thinking really, you know, that we're getting more and more of these sort of probably 14 or even 13 to 16 year olds um and so yeah just just thinking through whether we need to be a little bit more careful and slow them down from their return and i think you sort of answered that adam was saying that we um you know we need to be a bit bit careful on on their reconstruction that things are a little bit different so yeah, yeah. and i know there's a, a really great cohort study um out of norway actually um that's followed i think 12 to 14 year olds about 80 of them who have um had an acl injury and they've sort of looked at who undergoes reconstruction surgery, who, un who stays, um, you know, un undergoing rehab only. And what they've found is that if you, people, the young guys, 12, 13 year olds do really well uh, without an ACL reconstruction, if they're happy to reduce their sport, um, pivoting sport type of level of activity. So if they want to go back and they're going back and playing the soccers and the footies, basketballs, then there's a higher rate of meniscal tears. Um, but if they're happy to reduce that level of activity, then they do really well without having an ACL reconstruction, even in the young group, which I think is really important because if we can try and um, leave them be until they're at least 18 and they've matured and they've, you know, they've got a, a hamstring graft um, or a patellar graft that's large enough to withstand the loads they're going to put through when they're 30, um, allowing them to develop um, up to that point, I think is really important if we can. That's really interesting. And so you're sort of talking about uh, so that rehab goal is more about delaying surgery and then it being a more appropriate option down the track. Yep. Yep. Potentially. And I think that's um, more broadly for any patient who's had an ACL injury is that there's quite um, you know, strong evidence from randomized, a really strong randomized controlled trial that's been published almost 10 years ago now as well showing that there's very little differences in the outcomes between people who have an early ACL reconstruction and those who have a, an option, uh, undergoing rehab only with the option of having a delayed reconstruction if and when necessary. And so outcomes that they looked at, this is a study from Sweden, were you know, arthritis, were return to sport, were symptoms, quality of life, meniscal tears and re-injury surgery, and there was very little difference in any outcome. And so while I was overseas working and collaborating with that group recently, I was able to do some analysis on their MRI data, looking at whether an early reconstruction or rehab only actually increased the risk of arthritis um, between those two groups. And what we found, somewhat surprisingly actually, was that the early reconstruction group actually had more cartilage thinning, so early signs of arthritis in their knee in the first five years, compared to the group who had the optional delayed surgery. So most of them had rehab only with a few crossing over to having delayed surgery. So I think wherever we can, the evidence suggests we should at least trial a period of non-operative management and always go and have surgery later. Um, bear in mind, this is in a non-elite athlete population. So the elite population is probably a different kettle of fish. Um, but for a broad recreational athlete, I think there's um, you know, strong evidence now that wherever possible, we should try a non-operative management approach. If they fail, if they have ongoing giving way, despite progressive intensive rehab, they need to almost, I say you need to prove that you're unstable. So if you can prove despite really strong you know, rehab that you're still unstable at the level of sport that you want to play at, then maybe you're a surgical candidate, but, but prove that to me. It's really interesting and I sort of definitely want to talk more about the non-operative and operative, but I think one of the things that we've been talking about is sort of poor outcomes following ACL or sort of 
what and what that actually means. So I actually might go to Sarah Ward here to ask her question along those lines. Hey, um, hey all. Hi, Adam. Um, Hi, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, hope you're well. Um, just a quick question. We, we throw around these terms of poor outcomes and good outcomes, depending on the way we look at it. Do we have a, a working definition of what a good outcome is? Um, sort of in terms of, is there an ideal outcome measure or a metric or a combination of outcome measures that we could use to define outcome at X many years or months post-surgery? It's a great question, again, and because I think good and poor outcome are so multifaceted and different for different people, it's really uh, complex to try and encapsulate that in one specific criteria. I would um, say, though, and point you to a paper that was published in BJSM, uh, I think in 2015, where they actually interviewed about 2,000 uh, rehab professionals, surgeons, um, doctors, about what they defined as being a successful outcome after an ACL injury and reconstruction. And really interestingly, the five key um, criteria that developed consensus in this questionnaire between all these different types of medical professionals across the world was the first one was an absence of giving way. So if the knee didn't give, what, give way, that was considered a success. A return to sport at the desired level that the patient wanted. Some people don't want to go back to full pivoting sport. Um, and so if, if those people don't want to go back to sport because of family or work, then they, that shouldn't necessarily be considered a, not a success because it's not necessarily knee related. The third one was having a quadriceps and um, hamstring strength, at least 90% um, st strength compared to the uninjured side. So having a functional successful outcome. Absence of knee effusion. So making sure there was no swelling or you know, biological reason why the knee hasn't settled. And then finally was a patient reported outcome measure of at least 85 or 90% out of 100. And there was really a lot of different um, uh, idea of what that patient reported outcome is or should be, um, because there's lots out there, as I'm sure you know. Um, so that they didn't really sort of highlight one specific one to measure to capture a successful outcome, but, but knowing that that should be a part of a, a suite of of assessments, if you like, to define overall success? It's a great question, Sarah, and it's sort of really fascinating about how there's quite different outcomes from a clinician academic perspective. I suppose we're sort of lucky enough to have Brooke, who's got a bit of lived experience with an ACL and what defines a good outcome. Do you want to sort of share some of your perspectives, Brooke? Yeah, sure. I guess, yeah, having lived the, the physical and psychological experience of it, um, I've initially um, really struggled with the, like, rehabbing and getting the confidence to go back. And um, actually, when I met Adam is when I was tested for a study and that actually, that, that testing process and going through a lot of those things that Adam just talked about gave me the confidence that I was actually doing okay and to go back to basketball training. Before that, I was like, oh, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. Um, so I think testing your patients and giving them some figures, I'll talk about figures maybe in a minute, that will give them the psychological confidence. Um, and, yeah, I guess it just depends on and what the goals are and what their expectations were and um, everyone's going to be so different. I've been looking into the outcome measures a lot at the moment and, and what's normal for whether it's a coos or whether it's a hop test or a strength test. And uh, I know Adam mentioned the limb symmetry. We, we kind of look at this 90% magical number and um, I've published a paper recently looking at that, which um, I think is important to bring up at this point that there are limitations with using that limb symmetry index because as all you clinicians probably know that the contralateral limb um, may not be, I guess, the acceptable standard, especially maybe a year down the track that we, um, that contralateral limb actually deteriorates with time or perhaps it's not even, wasn't even an acceptable standard to, to begin with. So I think it's um, important to maybe try and do some hop testing to figure out what is normal and what is going to be that good outcome for your patient earlier post-op on the other, other side. Um, even if you get them in that pre-op, prehab um, period, you could get them to do some hot testing once their knee's settled 
on that other side and you might get a better idea of what's a, a good outcome for them later down the track and same maybe with the strength testing as well. Some great perspectives and I think sort of really useful to have that not only from a research perspective but what's important to the, the, the athlete or the, pers- the individual who's had an ACL uh, rupture. Now, we're going to go to Hamish Ashton, which I think, Hamish, this is, you're going to have to get a frequent flyer card and get your fifth question free because I reckon I've come to you a couple of times, but just keep asking great questions. So, Hamish, do you want to ask a question about osteoarthritis and rehabilitation? Hi, everyone. Um, Yeah, my question is a little bit about the commitment to rehab in the sense that um, I was lucky to enough recently to spend a bit of time in a gym-based clinic. And not only did we sort of rehab our ACLs to the nine months, like the Hughes protocol and things like that, we then spent another three months sort of really working on their strength and everything beyond that before we recommended they went back to play. So the question sort of leading on from that is really, you know, is there evidence anywhere that those ones that put the time into the rehab have better outcomes? Because a lot of people through either time or commitment or not having the finance probably don't go through that rehab protocol as far as they perhaps could do. I'm, I'm happy to take that one. That's a great question, Hamish, and I'm, I'd be happy to send all of my ACL patients to your to your clinic because in Australia there's a um, uh, not that uh, old study, so a recent study showing that less than five percent of ACL injured patients in Australia receive at least six months of rehab, which include progressive strengthening exercises and a return to sport testing. So less than five percent. Um, go through that process, despite that being the current best available evidence as what we should be doing with our patients. So what you're doing sounds fantastic. I think um, there's some really great evidence, again, coming from Norway, showing that we need to wait at least nine months um, before sending these patients um, who've had an ACL reconstruction back to sport, because for every month we delay a return to pivoting sport, will reduce the risk of an ACL re-rupture by 50%. Now, that's pretty damning statistics to me. And if, if we educate our patients about that, then they shouldn't be going back to sport without excellent rehab um, and allowing that biological healing up to that nine-month mark. I, I think as a profession, we do a great job in the early stages of rehab, you know, resolving impairments, but it's that end stage, um, which while your, clinic, while your clinical work sounds so impressive, where you're getting these people through a, a sport-specific training type environment and preparing them for for the rigors that they're going to go back to. And I think educating these patients about who may be not, you know, having the finances or not motivated to, to keep coming to rehab, it's a difficult process. It's a long process. It can be boring. We need to develop ways that engage the patients and, you know, having a week off every now and again um, can be a great thing to re-energize these patients. Um, but I, I think that achieving excellent strength and excellent function, as some of Brooke's work she's just talked about has shown, is great for future outcomes as well. So I think the underlying you know, principle being that we need to um, really work these people quite hard and intensely in terms of the strengthening to, to get them to a level above and beyond what they were before. They actually had an ACL injury initially. Let's take the time to actually build them up better than they, what they were before because they had an ACL injury then. Let's actually prevent the next injury by, by pre- rehabbing them even better. So I think that to the types of discussions and education with your patients to empower them with the knowledge um, about the importance of, of optimal rehab for sure. Sorry, the muted microphone got me again. It always gets me at least once in one of these uh, Q&A webinars. Um, thanks again, Hamish, and we'll uh, send you your frequent fly card out in the mail soon. Um, now, I'm going to take the sort of tact of trying to be slightly controversial or start to um, get people to think a little bit. We had one question from an anonymous attendee, and very simply they asked, based on the current evidence, should anyone have an ACL reconstruction after an ACL injury? So I know it's a big question, and there's probably uh, sort of, it's not an absolute yes or no, but it'd be good to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so you can have, yeah, it's a, the $64 question. You can have 
one end, everyone has a reconstruction. The other end, no one have a reconstruction. The truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. And I think, as I said earlier, it's actually putting them through, putting these patients through their paces if, if they're wanting to try a non-operative management to start with, for example, um, and actually see how they progress. Give them the opportunity. You've got nothing to lose. And keep progressing them with an intensive rehab period. Try and get back to a level of activity that they'd like to. And if as you increase the ladder of um, pivoting, you know, more intense activity, if they start to have a knee that gives way or if they start to not cope with that, um, you know, higher intensity, their knee starting to swell or whatever reason, those indicators of maybe there's a not successful outcome, then maybe start thinking that for this patient, for their quality of life, they would like to get back to a level of activity, whether that's, you know, going back to play football or whatever, or for work, employment, if you're a labour, um, you know, worker with uh, heavy loads through their knee, then maybe for some people it really is important to have a reconstruction to stabilise the joint. Some people, for whatever neuromuscular reason, do a great job of having muscle control to be able to compensate for the structural instability, whereas other people, um, despite all the efforts, tend not to be able to overcome the structural instability with the, the neuromuscular control. So I, I use the analogy of an ACL is like a seatbelt with patients. So we all wear seatbelts all the time, but it's only very rarely do we actually really rely or need a seatbelt in an accident. So most of the time walking around during the day and most activities, we don't actually need or rely on our ACL. We could get by without an ACL. But if you're someone who you know, puts their knee under undue stress or high impact in a lot of different sports at that level you want to get back to, and you need a seatbelt more often, then maybe it's important to have that structural instability. Um, but I think proving that you have a structural instability is almost like a, a tick box for me before um, undergoing surgery. You can always try rehab and have surgery later. You can't, have, you can't undo surgery. And as I've said earlier, having surgery tends to increase the risk of osteoarthritis. We know that re-injury rates are you know, upwards of 20% having a reconstruction isn't the panacea, the, you know, the perfect knee. Um, it's costly. It's not, um, it can be associated with, you know, side effects, infection, swelling, it's angry. It's another trauma to the knee, all those things. And I'm sure I haven't had an ACL injury, but Brooke can, can speak to how that knee looked from a, a psychological point of view day one after hospital. It can knock people around a fair bit. So um, we need to take all of those things into consideration. I think just to add to that as well, especially for our older patients, um, I think a lot of them go and we see them in our cohort and then also in the second study that I've um, recently done is they don't really realise that the surgery just doesn't fix it and, and what's actually involved. And really at the end of their rehab, a lot of them, these older patients, their lifestyle priorities change. They don't actually decide that they want to go back to sport anyway. So I think it's probably trying to talk to them pre-operatively with it deciding if they're going to have surgery or not or actually just highlighting that it is an option, but especially for those patients where you think maybe they're not that competitive, maybe they're a bit older, maybe they've got a family and, and they might end up down in that um, track down, that they don't actually need that reconstruction anyway. That shared decision-making and communication about the risks and benefits of both options just sounds really important, especially with all the research that you've both done about what the sort of, uh, you can call them side effects to the, uh, to the um, cartilage and the knee joint having undergone that surgery. Um, now, we're probably going to have just time for one last question. And, Brooke, we might get your perspective here because I know you've recently been part of a systematic review on this topic. Um, Hemant, unfortunately, isn't here anymore, but uh, they asked, uh, does gender have an influence on knee osteoarthritis post-ACL reconstruction? Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, the systematic re review we did recently was on... Um, the effectiveness of injury prevention programs in female football codes. And of course, we know that um, female athletes are more at risk of sustaining an ACL reconstruction. So um, when you account for exposure, so, um, but in terms of actually after, if you compare males and females after they've had a reconstruction, um, the 
the systematic reviews in the literature out there, you, there's kind of conflicting evidence of the effect of um, gender on the development of arthritis. So, as I said earlier, the only really strong factor is that um, those meniscal lesions or cartilage lesions that they see at the time of surgery. Um, if anything, if it was leaning towards one way, I would say actually the males, there's been a few studies show that they have more of those early changes. And, um, and I'm only hypothesising here that perhaps the males are the ones that are pushing to go back to sport, um, a little bit more risk taking and exposing their knee to, to more load is my kind of thought there. Anything you wanted to add, Adam? Oh, you're going to have to unmute your microphone. Sorry, that old trick. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I mean, obviously, females are a little bit more at risk of like some of those patellofemoral joint changes in the general. Yeah, and, and also the re-injury as well. Females tend to yeah. Um, yeah. have higher rates of re-injury and having a re-injury, you know, we know that that's a secondary trauma to the knee and that increases the risk of these types of outcomes, poor outcomes, longer term, ongoing symptoms and instability and um, OA as well. So that's just something to consider. Yeah, so young female athletes, um, you'd be really trying to yeah, make sure they're ticking all those boxes and, and pushing them out because you know that they're at a higher risk of, of re-injury, making sure they're looking at those injury prevention programs and their teams are implementing those. Brilliant. There's just so many fantastic little nuggets and sort of clinical gems in there. And I sort of wanted to give you the scenario in terms of a patient comes to you tomorrow with a ruptured ACL. I just wondered if you could summarize some of the sort of hot tips or sort of key takeaways that you'd end up communicating to the patient about the sort of stuff we've been discussing tonight. Yeah, it's a good, good question. I think in terms of OA, I wouldn't day one, tell them you've had an ACL injury, your knees, you know, you're at risk of OA. You have to be really careful about how you educate um, patients in that space. Some people are already really fearful and devastated that they've had an ACL injury. And so presenting them with this information that's going to happen in 10 years, perhaps, that they might have a high risk of osteoarthritis is probably not going to add value at that point in time. I think it's a different story if they're four to six months down the track and then maybe not you know, losing maybe motivation and not being adhering to exercises is, is actually turn it into a positive spin and say, we've got an opportunity now to really strengthen and, and develop this great function, which is going to prevent you um, based on the current evidence, or at least you reduce your risk of having developing arthritis longer term. So let's actually work on this together. Now, I think repeating functional testing so that patients can see progress throughout is really helpful for getting buy-in in, in terms of, choosing an operative or non-operative management, my take home is, is that it's totally the patient's choice. You just have to empower them with the knowledge and the evidence based on your understanding that we've all talked about here tonight and say what it is that you've got. Many people do well with um, a rehab only without having an ACL reconstruction. And even if you have to have an ACL reconstruction later, that doing a really strong pre-operative program, so whatever you do now is going to be benefiting you after surgery as well. So irrespective of whether you continue down the non-operative path or whether you actually go and have surgery, it's all good. You're all adding money in the bank um, to increase your outcomes after surgery as well. So um, I think the education stuff's really interesting. There's actually no study that I know of that's actually looked at the isolated effect of an education um, intervention delivered to patients because we normally package it with exercises or we package it with surgery but i think um, it's probably undervalued um, musculoskeletal health um, conditions including acl um, because that's really where you get the buy-in from the patients from a rehab perspective like we talked about earlier um, if you you know don't get the buy-in you don't not going to achieve a great outcome with a function and then be at risk of longer term outcomes um, as well so that's my take and that's such a great highlight for the other paper you've sort of published recently about sort of worse uh, knee confidence or the sort of psychological factors being associated with uh, poor poorer outcomes. And I know that sort of a number of other research groups have found similar things. So we've unfortunately run out of time tonight. Um, Adam and Brooke, thank you so much for giving up your time and all those uh, fantastic gems and insights. I think everyone uh, that's attending today will give you a virtual uh, round of applause. So thank you very much.
Oh, great. Thanks for being here, um, Brooke and Sean. It's great to chat um, and have some interest from around the world. So it's great. Yeah, thanks everyone and lots of other great questions and I know that we'll be answering um, those after this session um, and get back to you all. Thanks everyone. That's a great segue. So yes, we will be doing in the next week or so a follow-up session where we will cover off some of the questions that we missed out on tonight and sort of unfortunately we can't get to all of them. As I mentioned before, make sure you bookmark uh, Laysom's blog as well as uh, check out our YouTube channel for all the webinars that we've uh, done up until today. Um, Lastly, once you exit the webinar, you will um, be taken to a post-webinar survey. Uh, I know if you've done this uh, multiple times, you've probably already filled in this survey, but would be great for you to do it again because that feedback's so useful for us to see what guests and what topics you'd like to cover, but also where we can improve. And we've slightly changed the question, so getting your input would be great. So again, Thank you so much for coming. Oh, Adam, did you have one last Sean, can I, just, can I just finalise with a quick plug? So we obviously have a couple of research projects that are ongoing and hoping to start up again post-COVID um, pandemic uh, shutdowns and things. So if you're interested in, in finding out more about our, our ACL research, we've um, got a dedicated email address. Um, if you've got patients who had an ACL injury who you think might be interested in being involved in our research, we do a lot of different research from you know the initial injury right through five to 10 years down the track. So we're really looking for anyone, uh, any participants. The email address is ACL study, all one word, at latrobe.edu.au. So we're very happy to chat um, about those research projects and, and have your participants, uh, patients coming through. Thanks, John. Brilliant. We'll make sure that's in the blog so people can access that information easily. So again, thank you all for attending. It's always overwhelming with the fantastic response that we get. Um, until next time, uh, thank you. See you then.